Hello and welcome to What's In It For Africa, the Inside The Issue show with me, Uzo Madu, where we delve deep into EU policy issues that have African implications and speak to the experts to find out more. On this month's show, we have a one-on-one -on -one interview with Member of the European Parliament, Jude Curtin-Darling, discussing the Economic Partnership Agreement, the EPA, between the Economic Community of the West African States, ECOWAS, and the European Union. Jude Curtin-Darling is a member of the European Socialist and Democrats political party in the European Parliament, and also a vocal member of the International Trade Committee, which is leading the discussions in the Parliament on this agreement. So, before we get into the interview, let's start with the status quo of the relations between the EU and West Africa. The West African region is actually the largest trading partner on the sub-Saharan African region for the European Union and also its most important investment partner on the African continent as a whole. EU annual exports to the West African region total around 31 billion euros and West African annual exports to the EU total around 37 billion. Now products most commonly traded are fuel and food products. Now that we understand a bit more about the trading balance between these two regions, let's now discuss the trade agreement and what's on the table. In February 2014, after over a decade of discussions, the ECOWAS and the EU concluded negotiations on the Economic Partnership Agreement. Now, after the conclusion of the negotiations, what has to happen is that EU and ECOWAS policy decision makers need to sign and ratify the agreement. However, up until this date, the Gambia, Mauritania and Nigeria have failed to do so. The agreement itself is aimed at reciprocal trade, sustainable development and furthering regional integration according to the EU. Now the essence of the agreement itself is that the European Union would open its markets duty and quota free to West African trade and on the other side the West African market would open up 75% of its market to the European Union. Now, the 25% that's not subject to liberalisation for products going into the West African market are made up largely of food products, but also other products such as spirits, uh, other type of liquors and fully built cars. This seemingly unevenness of the agreement really occurs because of the different industrialisation uh, stages of the European Union and the African countries. The majority, 11 out of the 16 ECOWAS member states, are actually least developed countries. Now, what this means is that they exhibit the lowest indicators of socio-economic development. Countries, for example, such as Togo, Niger and Liberia, to name a few. Now, what this means in the EU context is that they actually do have duty and quota-free access already to the European Union under the Everything But Arms scheme. This means that least developed countries actually have less of an incentive to sign the economic partnership agreement with the European Union. So we posed the question to member of the European Parliament, Jude Curtin-Darling, and asked her the question, in what way is this agreement better or worse than what has gone before? So the um, West Africa Economic Partnership Agreement between the EU and ECOWAS and the countries of West Africa is a better agreement for some of the countries in terms of market access and it's um, more or less the same for the others. So uh, the vast majority of countries in West Africa have everything but arms access to the European market which means they have tariff-free, uh, quota-free access to the EU market. Uh, with the exception of um, two, Cape Verde and Nigeria. And um, in comparison to what would be available for them, uh, the Economic Partnership Agreement is better in terms of market access than the generalised system of preferences, which would be the alternative, the GSP system. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, in terms of classic trade, um, the um, Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, the market access into the EU market for West African goods is um, better with the Economic Partnership Agreement. 
Several West African countries raised concerns during the negotiations about how this agreement might affect their economies. For instance, deindustrialization, but also regional disintegration, and also a loss of tariff revenues. So with these concerns in mind, we put the question to the MEP, does the agreement go far enough in protecting the disruption possibly caused to West African economies? So we've, there is a, an asymmetry in terms of market access. So whereas it's full access to the EU market, there's um, a proportion, about 25% of tariff lines are protected uh, for West Africa to allow um, that kind of industrial policy to ensure that, that it's not liberalised too quickly. But we've heard as MEPs a lot of concerns raised that it's not asymmetri asymmetrical enough as an agreement. And as we're looking at the um, economic partnership agreements, not just with West Africa, but with East Africa and Southern Africa as well, because the three are coming through the European Parliament um, more or less at the same time. Um, that's one of the, the issues that we're really looking at in depth to see if there is enough asymmetry and then if there isn't what other tools are there to ensure that we can support um, and avoid that there's um, an undermining of infant industries that we support some policy space so that national um, industrial policies and economic policies can play out um, but that's that's where these agreements are quite interesting but also quite difficult is the combination of trade and development uh, policy of ensuring that the development uh, cooperation which goes alongside the trade agreement is adequate uh, to support the, uh, the opening up that the trade agreement will do. Now, focusing in on the regional integration issue on we in West Africa, one thing is clear. It is one of the key objectives of this agreement set out in the legal text. However, one of the central arguments against the ECOWAS and other African Economic Partnership Agreements not being in the interest of regional or continental integration is because of the way the regional blocks are set up. In fact, the economic partnership negotiations have produced regional blocks that are not consistent with the regional economic blocks on the continent themselves. So, for example, Mauritania is not part of the ECOWAS community, however, it is part of the negotiation block under the EPA. Also, if you look at the Southern African Development Community, SADAC, actually 13 of its members are spread between three regional economic blocks for the purpose of the economic partnership agreements. So considering this, we then ask MEP Jude Curtin, darling, how then does the proposed ECOWAS EU economic partnership support regional integration in West Africa? But also, how do the other African economic partnerships support wider regional integration on the continent? Well, this was uh, before I became an MEP. I um, was a, a trade union leader, and um, I did a lot around um, building up trade union relations with the trade unions uh, across the African continent. And a lot of our discussion was about whether the um, economic partnership areas were natural regions um, in Africa, and in some cases, they're more easily kind of uh, easily fitted together than in others. Um, I suspect that West Africa is an example of one region where it does actually work as a frame for regional cooperation. And I think the way we've seen the ECOWAS countries negotiate together uh, with the EU has demonstrated that, that it is promoting a kind of regional um, uh, integration strategy. In other regions, the, uh, the way that the economic partnership agreements divide, they actually cut across traditional trade flows or trade relationships and that becomes then a bit more difficult. Um, but uh, so I think we have to see these economic partnership agreements as part of a kind of mosaic and at the moment they sit inside our broader relations with the African continent, with the African Union um, and the EU has been a, a big supporter of um, African Union integration and countries across the continent of Africa working together. We're now coming and will arrive in the next few years to the end of the Cotonou um, agreement and we'll be looking at what comes 
post Cotonou um, and I think in all the discussions that I've been involved in there's a real um, desire to ensure that there is regional cooperation built um, but the experience of the EU and European integration is that trade's only one part of that integration um, and in order to build up regional cooperation we need to be building cooperation around social questions. We know that there are big flows of migrant workers within West Africa, within um, African regions and across the continent of Africa. Um, and um, and so we we need to be ensuring that we've got we're building up the trade dimension, but also recognizing that there's a social and there's a societal um, dimension of increased regional cooperation, and that needs to be addressed as well. That's the experience of the European single market shows that really strongly that we needed that social pillar to bring social acceptance of a broader integrated market, and I suspect that will happen with African regional integration as well. And looking forward, essentially because the current agreement is stuck due to the Gambia, Mauritania and Nigeria refusing to sign the agreement, what happens next? Are there going to be bilateral deals between individual West African countries and the European Union? Are we going to scrap the deal? What is the alternative? I mean, I, I think um, it's up to the countries what they decide to do and it's up to the regions how they decide to um, work together so what we have on the table are these agreements I actually think we're not a hundred percent happy with uh, the way the final text of the economic partnership agreements particularly in relation to questions of sustainable development um, and how civil society is engaged in the monitoring and the follow-up of the um, agreements the way that labor and environmental standards are addressed um, in the agreements so um, what we're um, seeing is an opportunity before the signature of of these other of the last three countries before they sign the agreements that gives us a window of opportunity to try and push for perhaps some strengthening of some elements of the agreements to ensure that um, agreements which are designed to benefit um, the economies of West Africa also benefit the societies of West Africa and that um, the public in West Africa and in East Africa and in Southern Africa are able to actually engage, effectively monitor and look at how these um, agreements are implemented on the ground because that's the best, you know, coming back to your earlier question mm -hmm. about um, policy space and ensuring that asymmetry, allowing the space for countries to develop, to develop their own um, economic strengths and, and industries. Well, part of that is about having a functioning state um, in terms of state apparatus and social security and taxation and part of getting to that point is having a functioning civil society. Mm -hmm. So we, we see civil society engagement as absolutely crucial and we're using this small window that we've got before we get the final text into the European Parliament and we get to say very brutally yes or no uh, to those final texts. We're trying to see if we can't leverage some more um, uh, capacity building and um, specific role um, for civil society in Africa in the process. Thank you for watching Inside the Issue this month. Next month, we're going to be delving deep into the Brexit for or not for Africa debate. Until then, subscribe to our YouTube channel, like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter and visit our website. My name is Uzo Madu for What's In It For Africa.